1997, four years after the death of the well-known Pablo Emilio Escobar Gabiria, Netflix was created. And from the day it came to limelight, Netflix had its share of fame and controversies about what had happened to Escobar, who attracted such all at once. It was not surprising when it collided with Narcos in 2015, where fame, hits and controversies followed instantly. Netflix's thorough research and the artistic writing and directing of Brazilian filmmaker José Padilla added rich dramatic effect to the story, which has been praised by many critics. However, political stories like these can always be far from perfect, and sometimes the devil might actually be in the details messing with it, hiding something. This could be such a strong accusation, but for those who want to seek exposure to other aspects of the story can really be helpful. These aspects include the sides of the story which only a few people know about, the behind the scenes, the over-dramatized truths, the cartels and the known after stories of Escobar. There are 10 things that Netflix is obviously hiding about our man Pablo Escobar. We will be playing spoilers beyond the spoilers and exposing 10 hidden manifestations that Netflix is trying to cover. Who then is Pablo Escobar? A cartel leader, the first narco-terrorist and the richest criminal of all time. Let's begin uncovering the covered truth. Number 10. The original plan for narcos. Originally, the planned story will be a full-length feature film and not a TV show. However, when they started to dig deeper into the evidence and research, they were certain that a single movie wouldn't be enough as they uncovered several stories about the origins of his wealth. Beginning with the life of a man named Cockroach, who stole gravestones before smuggling, in combination with their personal experiences, DEA agents Steve Murphy and Javier Pena proved to the producers they did not know anything about Escobar. With this, Narcos was born. Bernardo Aparicio Garcia, who grew up in Escobar around Colombia, praises the show's comprehensiveness. In Pablo's mother's home, he noted the correct depiction of ethnic diversity and tinier details like miniature facades of colonial village houses. Number 9. Escobar's Recordings A very detailed show was a result of Escobar's recordings. He believes that keeping records and videos of events in his haciendas as they occurred, and so the team were able to create a pretty fair type of conversations, fashion, and the routine activities of Escobar and the people around him. In the movie, Escobar sits and broods, looking into space while contemplating how to make the next big move in his war with the government. But the truth of the matter was that Escobar contributed significantly to the production of the show. In fact, it is easy to say that the Medellin cartel was a fan of the media because some of his recordings were inserted in the show, including the activities within his haciendas. He was someone willing to buy or kidnap news reporters to tell his side of the story. One thing's for sure, Pablo would have loved Twitter. Number 8. Family Opinion this is quite important to know, because we have to weigh how much of the story and Pablo's interaction with his family was accurate, and how the rest of the Escobars feel about it. If you had watched the show, you'd be asking where Escobar's brother was all the time. Roberto Escobar, Pablo's brother, was infuriated with the show. To take note of, Roberto was not only Pablo's brother, he was also the cartel's accountant up until he was arrested when Pablo died. And so it was not surprising that Roberto was not happy when the show presented another accountant called Blackbeard being arrested and then snitching against the cartel to officials. In response, Roberto requested compensation of $1 billion from the streaming giant for depicting his and his brother's image without consulting him or even other family members. And since it was just the first season, and so he also offered to look through the second season for inaccuracies before it aired. The betrayal of Pablo in the Palace of Justice siege was also contested by other family members, as well as the manner of his death. Number 7. Pablo Escobar's Gruesomeness As depicted in the show, Pablo Escobar was one of the most terrifying men to walk the earth. 
Steve Murphy explains how before Escobar, law enforcement was not familiar with narco-terrorism. What is narco-terrorism? This involves violence to influence government policies against narcotic laws. Pablo Escobar was the first narco-terrorist, according to Murphy, and his terrorist activities are well documented. In the show, it was very easy for Escobar to order the killings of others. However, his personal dealings with people never result in anything deadly. Well, except the undeniable instances like the killings of Moncada and Galliano. Other than that, Pablo is mostly shown as a troubled man with a loving relationship with his wife and kids. In reality, Don Pablo was a drug lord based on first-hand encounters from informants. Pablo can do all the evil doings of a terrorist like drilling into his enemy's kneecaps if he felt like it, using human mules as he paid for them, sewing cocaine into pets that were going to Miami, and mules being killed just to avoid spending cash. But think of this. Pablo Escobar was the seventh richest man in the world at the time, and he was avoiding spending extra cash. Come on. Another informant for agents Murphy and Penner was a waiter at one of Pablo's parties. He recounted that another waiter was caught stealing silverware. Pablo decided to duct tape the person's hands and throw him into the pool, and he ended up drowning as entertainment for the guests present at the party. And here is another instance that Escobar killed every single architect who built his hundreds of houses because he did not want anyone to know the secret of each estate. Even with the killings of childhood friends, Moncada and Galliano, it was depicted in the movie that Escobar sent the fingers of the men to their family members. All these make you wonder the true extent of his cruelty. But the question is, did those claims actually happen? Number 6. M19's True Nature Most experts disagree with this aspect. Knowing that M19 was one of the largest guerrilla groups in Colombia, in the show, M19 is portrayed as a bunch of naive idealists who didn't know about guerrilla warfare and was led by an ex-college professor who also didn't know anything about guerrilla warfare. Being the largest guerrilla group in Colombia, that, my friends, is a dramatic misrepresentation of the facts. M19 had one of the most feared presences in Colombia. Leonardo Aparicio Garcia details how his aunt had barely escaped the Palace of Justice attack. They were truly powerful, and they knew how to strike fear. Ivan Marino Ospina, or Ivan the Terrible, was an experienced guerrilla leader. In the show, before becoming leader of M19, Ivan had already fought in Venezuela, arrested and tortured to the point of almost committing suicide, only to escape while disguising as an army major six months later. He was called Ivan the Terrible because he always did things the less diplomatic way, and so he was grossly depicted in the show. And because he did not give Escobar the famous Bolivar sword, Escobar killed him. Number 5. Pablo's relationship with his family Pablo's family, as an integral part of the movie, was not really consulted. It's only natural that their interactions with Pablo were imaginative. This is a really dangerous way to tell a story, especially if you already have preconceived notions. No other relationship was more misconstrued than Pablo Escobar's relationship with his son, Juan Pablo, now known as Sebastian Marroquin. In several interviews, Sebastian often talks about his experiences as the son of the biggest drug trafficker. He explains how he remembers that his father loved him very much and that he learned so much about violence that he became a man of peace. Sebastian says that his father taught him all about the drugs, where perhaps education helped. Sebastian says his father taught him about all the drugs, where perhaps education helped or it was the memory of a relative who had suffered from the effects of drug abuse, that Sebastian has never felt the pressure to take drugs. One of the memorable interviews that Sebastian had when he recounts how he and his mother begged Don Pablo to stop his incursions on Colombia after the bombing that left his sister, Manuela, forever deaf in one ear. Their pleas fell on deaf ears as well. He also shared his father's nature of being a bad loser. He cited examples where he would cheat when they played games like Monopoly simply because he wanted to win. Even when Pablo calls him minutes before his death, Juan Pablo is portrayed as being very young and naive in the show. But in real life, 
Juan Pablo was already 16 by the time his father died. And take note, he has a radically different account of Don Pablo's death than what was shown in the movie. Number 4. Secrets of La Catedral In the show, Escobar's prison is revealed to be luxurious with a lot of the drug lord's personal items. Remember the recordings we talked about earlier? There was even more Escobar contents hidden in La Catedral. In the movie, Escobar leaves behind a large book with pictures in it. However, in Agents Murphy and Penner's book, Manhunters – How We Took Down Pablo Escobar, they explained how they found a film canister in the trash, and when they had the film developed, they found pictures of Escobar which they turned into wanted posters. According to Penner, he kept every wanted poster that had ever been issued against Escobar in Colombia, and just about every article that had appeared about him in his files. Also, the threatening notes from his enemies were carefully arranged. Escobar was very neat, and this was evident in the bathrooms of La Catedral, which Penner describes as curiously sparkling. But the most shocking discoveries were the letters from various mothers offering their daughters to Pablo for sex. The lace negligees, several vibrators and sex toys neatly arranged in a closet. A certain interesting detail of their book is the fact that Penner slept in Escobar's bed. He recounts that he couldn't sleep in the bed, tossing and turning all through the night. Number 3. Carlos Leder's Influence Carlos Leder was a German who had left his country to move to Colombia. He changed his name to Guillermo Leder and married a Colombian called Helena Rivas. He later went to America with his mum. After his parents divorced, Carlos landed in prison. It was a prison that he met a fellow inmate called George Jung who became his partner on planning how they would revolutionize the cocaine trade and begin transporting drugs to the United States using small aircraft. This means that he already had the business even before meeting Pablo Escobar, who became wealthy as ever as well. He even offered to pay Colombia's external debt twice so as to escape extradition. Number 2. Escobar's Suicide Suicide must be a very strange word to be associated with Escobar's death, since everyone knows of his extra tough character. But pay close attention and we will know him better. Pablo Escobar killing himself is a claim made by close family members like his brothers and his son Juan Pablo. Juan Pablo was the last person that Pablo Escobar spoke to before he died, and he gives a very convincing argument as to why he believes his dad's death was a suicide. Let us see his points. Juan Pablo says that his dad had always told him that the telephone was death because of the possibility that DEA and the police officers were monitoring airwaves to triangulate the locations of cartel members. Another point is that Escobar's family had just been rejected from Germany and were then forced to lodge in a Colombian hotel owned by the armed forces, which indicates that Escobar's family was never going to be safe wherever they went, and that the hotel phone lines were surely tapped. And surely, Pablo knew about it. Next point is the fact that Pablo had taught his son how to commit suicide in case they got captured. His father used to tell him that the best way to avoid torture and die quickly was to shoot into the right ear rather than into the mouth. Pablo's brothers confirmed that Pablo prefers to kill himself rather than be killed by the people pursuing him since it definitely would not be a pleasant death. Now, let's replay the last moments of Pablo with these facts in mind. Colonel Martinez and his son were using the directional gear to try and get any phone signal, while according to Juan Pablo, his dad called him seven times during that time. Juan Pablo understands that his dad is trying to save them from being interrogated by giving up himself. While on the phone with Martinez holding an antenna, the police stormed the house and the shooting ensued. Limon, Escobar's bodyguard, is killed, and Pablo is shot on the roof multiple times before his body goes limp. A bullet wound is found on Pablo's head during inspection. Guess where? That's right, at the right ear. Number 1. Wagner Murra's pro-drug stance Wagner played the role of Pablo Escobar in Narcos perfectly. The Brazilian actor was applauded for the role and is so synonymous with Escobar. However, they have even more in common. Murra believes that drugs like cocaine should be legalized, just like Escobar's stand. In a world where cocaine was legal, Pablo Emilio Escobar Gabiria 
would have been recognized as a shrewd businessman who became wealthy and gave back to the poor where he once belonged. Most of his ordered killings involved officials who wanted to have him locked up or extradited. But what do you think? Should cocaine be legalized? Let us know!